No? Okay. And if you have somebody standing by you, put your hand upon her shoulder and just say amen to everything you agree with. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for these women that are standing. They are mothers. May there is nobody laying hands on Jermaine Tavares. <clears throat> All righty. Oh, yes. All right. May they be blessed with love. May they be blessed with joy. May you overflow with their hearts, in their hearts with peace. Father, we ask for a magnification of the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit. And we ask, Lord, that we would be good children who would be loving to them, respectful, value them, and be obedient. Bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 Give the mothers a hug now. Make sure they get a big hug before they sit down. Okay, and now all you children may be excused to go to your various children things. Okay, you know what? Nobody told me anything, all right? I'm just sitting back there waiting to see it all unfold. I'm like, I have to unfold now. I'm the unfolding, right. Huh? You did? Okay. Yes, you did an amazing job. <clears throat> Were you talking to me or her? Me! Okay, see, I'll tell you what the amazing job is. It's the person who has to do all this. Okay, Lillian. Lillian, she's a mother. Okay. We need more mothers. Can the men have those? Awesome. Are they pink inside? Uh, breast cancer. There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Um, everybody stretch your hands forward, please. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to bless and anoint this offering, God, that is representative of faith in you. Open your windows of heaven and pour out blessings that can't be contained and lord we ask that over the next few minutes you would open our minds and hearts to receive your word in jesus name amen everybody have one of the study sheets if you don't uh josh can give you one or i don't know who has them but somebody does we're taking a slight detour from our study in the gospel truth because actually to me this is part of the gospel truth okay um now look on thursday uh, I, I, I was one of the pastors who prayed down at the Capitol on uh, uh, National Day of Prayer. Uh, I had no idea what they were going to ask me to pray for. They asked me to pray for the Supreme Court decision and same-sex marriage. So um, that was fun. Uh, uh, everybody was yelling by the time I was done. But um, I had a chance to interface with and talk to uh, all the other pastors uh, of churches that were down there. And we talked about Mother's Day, you know, uh, you naturally do the whole, what you guys have planned for Mother's Day. And uh, everybody loved my answer. I have no idea. Um, there are actually several pastors who were very jealous of me that I didn't have to have any idea. But uh, 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 one thing became abundantly clear. And that is, Mother's Day has become a more complicated holiday than it used to be. It used to be a very simple day, and all the children were there, and mothers would stand, and they would get lays, or they would get what, 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 uh, whatever the, the church had you know, deemed was going to be uh, the celebration for that, that year. And more pastors were telling me this year that Mother's Day is very complex, especially among mothers who are more mature, who have grown children, who are gone and are not there anymore. I was alarmed to find out how many other pastors have wives who have not heard from their children in over a year. When I say not heard from, I mean no Christmas card, no Mother's Day card, no phone call, no visit, nothing for over a year. And uh, the Bar Barna Research Group uh, that that, that does a lot of statistical analysis on the progression of the Christian church, recently did something that looked at how fragmented Christian families are getting. And the result was actually a little bit alarming because it seems to be progressing, uh, not improving, uh, with the introduction of what, what they refer to as the emergent church. What they're finding is the fragmentation between 
uh, family members seems to be widening and seems to be growing. Now, what this does is, uh, uh, and the change this elucidates is, on Mother's Day, when you have the mother stand and say, and you call out for children to come bring them things, there are a lot of women that are crying because they haven't heard from their children in a long time. Or they have a child that is uh, so off the tracks and so off the rails that Mother's Day is actually becoming a heartbreaking day for many uh, and not the comforting jubilant day that it used to be. And so many of my pastor friends are treating Mother's Day as a, as a different holiday than it used to be. Uh, to me, this is a sign of the end times, frankly. It says, you know, Jesus said in, in, in Luke that in the last days it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah and like it was as in the days of Lot. So it doesn't surprise us that this is the way it's going. But it falls to me and it falls to us to examine what the Word of God says in regards to how we are supposed to treat our parents and how we are supposed to treat mothers in particular on this day. Now, Titus chapter 2, verse 1 says, You must teach what is, a, is in accordance with sound doctrine. So, I don't care where culture is going. And I don't care what the emergent church thinks. I care about what the Word of God says. Is that alright with everybody? So let's take a look at what Scripture tells us we are supposed to do regarding our parents as we get older and as we mature. Now, Honoring your father and your mother, honoring your parents, is one of the most important concepts found in Scripture anywhere. Number one, it is included as one of the Ten Commandments. So as God lays out the instructions for His people at the base of Mount Sinai, right up there with, Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Right up there with, Thou shalt not have any gods before me is honor your father and your mother. To God, this is part of his design. Your mother was not picked by you. You get to choose your boyfriend or your girlfriend. You get to choose your friends. You get to choose your job. You get to choose where you're going to live. But you had no say in who your parents were. This woman who is your mother was a gift to you. She was chosen for you by God. Your father was chosen for you by God. This is all part of God's design. And the celebration and honor, we're going to study what that word means in a minute. Honoring your father and honoring your mother is kind of a function of appreciating and celebrating God's design. This is the mother you gave me. This is the father you gave me. They're not perfect. Several of them are severely flawed, but nonetheless, this is what you gave me. See, this is foundational Christian life, Kella. If in order to praise God, everything has to be exactly the way we want it to be, and the only time you praise God is when everything goes the way you want, that's, that's, that's not the foundation for praise and worship. We praise and worship the Lord like Paul and Silas did, even in prison. Even when they're being beaten, even when they're in chains, even when they're behind bars, at that time is when they lift up their hands and praise the Lord and cite Him as good. It's not when everything is going well. That's, that's not the sacrifice of praise that God is looking for. The sacrifice of praise is when things are not going well, you still glorify Him and you still give Him praise. Can I hear an amen? amen. In like manner... You don't only honor a mother or a father who is perfect. But you realize this is the mother, this is the father that God gave me, that this is by his design. And part of his citation is, I want you to honor your father and your mother. Part of Jesus' uh, summary of the law found in Mark chapter 10, when he's just kind of summarizing, well, you know what the law says? The law says this, that one of the things he mentions is honoring your father and your mother. So even to Jesus, in fact, there's even stronger citation that we're later going to take a look at. Even to Jesus, one of the key components that he is teaching his disciples about being a Christian and being a believer is honoring your father and your mother. Now the word honor is, is uh, the Greek word is tima. 
Tima. And the Hebrew word is uh, kabad. Now, both tima and kibad basically mean the same thing. It means to measure accurately. It means to ascribe the correct amount of value. To place the, not, actually, not just place the correct amount of value, especially in, in, in the terms uh, uh, of the word kabad. It not only means uh, 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 correct value, but it also means to not short. Don't short change. Don't, don't, don't go skinny on this. But be gracious. When we're talking about honoring father and mother, not only does God look to see that you give them the right amount of honor, but he looks to make sure, if the word Hebrew word kabod is correct, that you are not short changing, that you are not uh, 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 going light on that, but you are giving the right amount to them. Now, what are components of honor? When it says honor your father and your mother, what does that mean? Well, number one, of course, uh, love. Now, I actually had somebody come to me and say, you know, Pastor, nowhere in Scripture does it say you're supposed to love your parents. <clears throat> and uh, while that's true in the sense that there is no Scripture out there that says, thou shalt love thy father and thy mother, the Bible is so pregnant with exhortations to love everybody. In fact, we were just talking about this last Sunday. What are the two greatest commands? Number one, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And number two is as the same thing. Love others as yourself. So we are constantly commanded by God to be people of love. We are supposed to be loving. God is love. So love has got to be the number one on the list, regardless of whether there's a particular citation. I can't imagine God's intent is you know, you're supposed to love me and love everybody around you, but you're exempt from loving father and you're exempt from loving mother because there's no specific passage that says that. So I think love is number one at the top. Uh, number two, uh, well, basically, take notice of, respect. It's actually kind of the core meaning of kabad and uh, tima, value. This has to do with the way you speak to you, your mother and your father. This has to do with the way you regard them when they speak to you. You say things to them, certain things to them, to encourage them, to show your affection, to show their value to you, to make sure that they know how important uh, 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 they are to you. To take the time on a regular basis to call them, write them, Go see them and visit them. They are supposed to have and be granted a certain amount of valuation, not only materially, where we take of our substance and give things to them, but also of our time, which is the most important resource that most modern people have. Time is the hardest. We want to throw money at things, and we don't want to have to worry about actually investing time. But this is what God is looking for. See, this is important to God. This is vital to the Lord. I'm going to show you in a minute how important it is. But this is a vital component of his measurement of you as a Christian. We're going to study on Wednesday night, maybe not this week, but next week for sure, the judgment seat of Christ. And one of the criteria, um, Kahale, that's in there, uh, he's not going to ask you how much money you got in Bank of Hawaii. He's not going to ask you how much, what kind of car you drive. He's not going to ask you how big your house is. One of the questions he is going to examine is, how did you treat your mother, and how did you treat your father? This is foundational to me. He's going to look you right in the eye, and he's going to tell you how you treated your mother, how you treated your father, whether you honored them or not, the way my word says, is a reflection, basically, on how real my word was to you. We're supposed to take a look at this, another part of honoring is to obey. And we're going to talk about this at length right now. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Now, a lot of people confuse that. They think that they're talking about spiritual parents in there. They're not. They're talking about in the Lord. If you're a Christian, 
obey your parents. And this is reinforced in Colossians 3.20 where it says the same thing. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. This does what? Pleases the Lord. This does what? It pleases the Lord when you honor, when you respect, when you value, when you obey your parents. This is pleasing to God. He sees this as, you're doing me a solid when you do this. You are showing how much you love me. You're showing how much you respect me. You're showing how much you value my word. You're showing how obedient you are to what I want. Especially when you have a parent that is difficult to honor and difficult to respect. Especially then, Proverbs 6.20, which is foundational to being a believer, is, says this, My son, keep your father's command. And do not forsake your mother's teaching. Now, Nicole, take a look at this. Proverbs 6, 20, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Who is this written to? Because a lot of people think that that, that, that exhortation to obey your parents and respect their opinion, seek it even, is something only for children. But when I reach 21, that ends. See, now, this is a important component that has to be addressed when we're discussing the application of discipleship and scripture to our lives. Because the United States of America federal government may recognize you are an adult at 18 or 21. But nowhere in scripture does it say once you are a certain age, you are now exempt from following these things. As a matter of fact, this is just, just four verses prior to this verse are the seven detestable sins. And if you go through that, you'll recognize the audience, Tony, is adults. There are old Jewish men, elderly men, who are reading this in synagogue, right? And this is to them, this citation is to them. So the seven detestables, those are, that's a citation to adults. This exhortation, obey your father, obey your mother is a citation to adults, many of whom have children, who have wives. Proverbs 23, 22 says, Listen to your father who gave you life. Do not despise your mother when she is old, i.e., when your mother gets old. The, the, the imagery is when I was a little girl, you know, my mother's opinion was important. I should seek after it, and I, 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 and I should... Uh, 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 ascribe myself to it, but as an older now, I don't really have to check with my mother anymore. Do not despise your mother when she is old. Don't dismiss her. Don't, don't think you can get to a stage where your mother's opinion is no longer important. Now, understand, when I say this, I'm not talking about anti-scriptural or uh, uh, unscriptural citations. For instance, when I first got saved, my family was Buddhist. So they would want me to go uh, by son, that is, uh, uh, pray to the uh, uh, dead ancestors. And that's just part of the family function. And if I were to take these scriptures, well, since I am supposed to obey my parents, and they're telling me to go pray to my ancestors, and they're, going, they're telling me to go be Buddhist, then I have to listen to my parents and do that. Well, here's the thing, is in Acts chapter 5, verse 28, and you can study it later, uh, there's this very important component that says we must obey God rather than man. Say that with me. We must obey God rather than man. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, we must obey God rather than man. This is very important. So if your parent is telling you to do something that is contrary to Scripture, that you're actually covenant bound to not listen to. doesn't matter if I, your pastor, tell you, parent, teacher, police officer, doesn't matter who it is. If it's contrary to Scripture and it's a breach of Scripture, you have got to refuse. Can I hear an amen? amen. But most of the time, disagreements between children and parents have nothing to do with this. It has more to do with eating a certain kind of food or not doing this or coming home at a certain time. Is there a time when you're supposed to quote unquote leave parents? Well, according to Genesis chapter 2 and Jesus talks about it in Mark chapter 10, uh, for this reason 
uh, a, a man or a woman shall leave their father and the mother, and they shall be united to their spouse. So what is a time when you are supposed to kind of leave parents? When you get married. When you get married, Jesus goes on to say the two will become one flesh. They are no longer two but one. They are no longer two but one. You are married here. There is no longer Joe Lancor, and if he does this, he's going to get blessed this way. And here's Nancy Peterson, and she is on this side, and if she does this, she will get blessed this way. That doesn't exist to God anymore. God doesn't see that anymore. They are one. Everybody say that. They are one. That's what Jesus says. They are one. They're married now. They're one. There is no blessing that can only come to him but not come to her. To him, they're the same Joe, Nancy, unit. Nanjo, or whatever you want to call them. Okay? But they're just a singular unit. That's it. God sees them that way. And this begins a new family. But that doesn't mean because they are married, now Joe and Nancy can totally blow off their father and their mother. Don't have to listen to you. Don't have to call you. Don't have to write you. Don't have to see you anymore because now... I have to leave you and cleave. Well, that's true ideologi uh, ideologically, but we are still cited by God to honor our father and our mother. It just means that Jesus comes first, then spouse comes, and then other things. By the way, can I just say this for a second? If you're married, Jesus is the most important. Amen? Amen? Who's next? Who's next? One more time. Okay. It is an unscriptural, anti-scriptural position to say the children come first. They don't. Your spouse comes first. This is one of the clashes between especially local Hawaiian mentality and the Bible. The Bible says this right here, this husband and wife relationship, this comes first. This is the top priority. Once you get married, this is the top priority. And I always tell people, it's kind of like being on a plane. You know when it gets to a certain thing and the things that fall down, right, the rebreathers, and they tell you, uh, parents, put it on your own face first. After that, take care of your kid, right? Because if you pass out, you're not going to be able to help anybody. And the same thing is true of the marriage and the family situation. First, make sure this relationship is taken care of. Then, as a couple, you minister to the kids. But if you are impacting severely your, your married relationship in favor of kids, that's actually putting the cart before the horse. Honor your father and your mother. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2. Honor your father and your mother. That is, love them, respect them, value them, and obey them which is the first commandment with a promise. Ooh, promises. I like promises, especially when they come from God. The word promise is epangelia. Epangelia. And this is a promise. It's a sanctioned promise. It's one that activates when it is started. For instance, Richard, every single time you clap your hands like this and shout hallelujah, I'm going to give you a dollar. Now, from what point, from what point, I forgot my wallet. From what point is that promise active? From the moment I said it, from here on out it goes. Well, that's what epangelia means. God says, this is an epangelia. I say it, so it is going to start from now. Honor your father and your mother. Read it. Look at, look at it for yourself. Verse 3. That it may go well for you. Some translations say, in the land. Which means we are not talking about just spiritually go well for you. But it will go well for you in the carnal sense as well. He will bless your job. He will bless your work. He will bless your relationships. He will bless uh, the land in which you live. That it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on earth. Now, there is nothing wrong with exercise. And health. The Bible says physical training has some value, but spiritual training has eternal value. Now, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you're not supposed to treat it like rubbish on purpose. However, let me say this. Who wants to live a long life? 
you would be better served to pay attention to how you treat your parents than to continue to treat your parents like rubbish but go on some sort of special diet and make sure you're Iron Woman or Iron Man and you're riding your bike 50,000 miles a single day and you're doing this or doing that because you want to live a long time. I got news for you. If you diet like a madman and you work out like a, 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 a cuckoo guy so that your body fat index is, you know, 6% and, you know, your cardio resting, you know, beat uh, is 40 or something like that and your triglycerides, you don't have any. But you treat your parents like garbage. Bible says you're not going to live long. I don't care how you study and what kind of degree you have. The Bible says your life is not going to go well if you treat your parents like rubbish. Now, it does say fathers don't exasperate your children. You know what that means? Don't exasperate your children. It, it, actually, the, the word is, I, I love this word, paror gazette. Paror gazette. What it means is to push to dysphemism. Or, or to push to disillusion. It basically means don't push buttons. There are some parents that, I don't know what screw is loose, but they like needling their kid, and they like pushing buttons, and they say things just to see if they can get a rise out of the kid, and drive the kid crazy, and torment the kid. And I do not understand where this, I gotta keep you down under my thumb, thing comes from. I really don't. But that is an ungodly thing. We as parents are supposed to speak in a way that builds our children up. We want our children to surpass us. There is no place in Christian godly parenting for competition between a parent and a child. Somebody is going to be asked to lead worship at, uh, on, 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 in Washington, D.C. at the foot uh, uh, of the Capitol in 2017. Do I want to be the one who is asked to lead worship or do I want my son to be asked? I would rather it be him. I want it to be him. I want my son. And I'm supposed to dedicate myself time-wise, effort-wise, substantively. I'm supposed to give of and pour out of myself to make sure he is a better man than I am. A better Christian than I am. A more powerful minister of the gospel than I am. To spend whatever time and money and, and offer whatever effort he wants. I'm not supposed to push it on him, force it on him, but I'm supposed to make it available to him to train my child up. I am supposed to train my child up. Can I hear an amen? And I'm supposed to invest this in him. I want him to be better than me. I want him to pass me, surpass me. That's what parents want. And to exasperate a child and put them technically in a position where there's a no-win situation. So many children come to me and say, you know what, my, my, I, I've never heard my father tell me that he was proud of me. I don't hear my father tell me that ever. Listen, I understand it can be difficult. I was an adopted child. I did not have a good relationship with my dad. He, he, when he had cancer and he was dying, one of the last things he said to me, he looked in my eyes and he said, Adopting you was one of the worst mistakes in my life. It's very hard for me to hear. But, here's the thing. That didn't excuse me from loving him, respecting him, valuing him, obeying him, and honoring him. That can be difficult to deal with, but this scripture here helped me. It changed my life. Take a look. Proverbs 12, 16 says, if you're talking about a parent who is not a perfect parent, if you're talking about a parent who is not ideal, it says a fool shows his annoyance right away, but a prudent man, a wise man, overlooks an insult. Everybody say overlooks. It means comes over. It means pretends it's not there. As a righteous, wise child of a potentially abusive parent, one of the powers that the Holy Spirit can give you because it is in His Word Philippians 2.13 says, It is God which, which worketh in us both to will and to do His good pleasure. If you pray for it, God can give you an anointing to ignore and overlook insults. 
If you've ever asked for it, you can receive it. Just a special coating over your heart that is uh, the Holy Spirit's love that helps you do this. You want that? Let me pray for you for just a second. Because God gave it to me. Father, in the name of Jesus, lift your hands if you want this. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray this anointing upon each person who is crying out for it. In the name of Jesus, that you would anoint them and empower them with the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus to ignore insults. To completely overlook them to where they do not feel the sting or the prick of them, but rather it just rolls off them. Protect them in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. See, we're not supposed to exasperate our children. Instead, bring them up and train. And, and, and our children, by the way, are supposed to encourage us. You, if you are a child, you're supposed to be encouraging your mother. You're supposed to be encouraging your father to tell them, to call them, and, and, and remind them of how important they are to you. Not just love. Love is kind of a cheap one actually at a certain level. Look at me now because I, I, I'm serious about this. Love you mom, love you dad, love you mom, love you dad. It's become such a part of our culture. It's almost like soothsaying. And to actually take the time to look at them, look in the eye and say, you know what, I really respect you. Ready for the conjunction because this is the important part. For blank. See, when you add that conjunction, when you add for this, now you're trapped. Now you got to think. Now, then that's the essence of praise, by the way. Praise you, Lord, for. Not just praise you, Lord, praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But think. Engage your heart and your mind. What are you praising God for? In like manner, when you talk to a parent, thank you for this. I love you for this. I respect you for this. You know what I value in you? I value this. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Mom, for telling me this because that really helps me do this. See, more communication helps. Every single Wednesday night and every single Sunday morning, there's not a week that goes by that when we get home, Joshua does not put his hand on my shoulder and say, Dad, you did a great job today. And he engages his mind. I really liked it when in your sermon you said this, or I, I, I thought when you brought that song into worship, it was like super powerful and I could feel the Holy Spirit. He gives thought to it. And that encourages me and that lifts me up. Parents and children need to lift each other up. Can I hear an amen? amen? See, your Christian parents are also brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have to remember the way we're told to act towards each other. Live in harmony, 1 Peter chapter 3 says, with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. How many of you guys want to inherit a blessing? Amen. Don't insult back. Even when a parent becomes ab abusive, you just ignore that insult and continue to be loving and respectful and value them. Now, are you supposed to correct an elder? No, never. Let me address this just for a second. 1 Timothy chapter 5. It says, do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as though he were your father. Don't rebuke, exhort. Don't rebuke, exhort. Don't rebuke, exhort. Now, this is a pretty easy thing to apply, but what that means is, as a younger person, it is not my place to tell my father ever, you are wrong. Because that's a rebuke. I can tell him that it might be helpful if you would do this, Dad, it would be more effective if you would do this. But even if your mother is a rampaging, drunken, profane idiot, it is not your place to correct your mother and tell her, no, you're wrong. Instead, Mom, it would be so much better if this were to happen or that were to happen. You can exhort, but you cannot rebuke. How important are these things? Take a look at Mark 7, then we're done. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, who's talking? You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God. What are they setting aside? The commands of God. So what we're about to study here is a command of God. To observe your own traditions. Ooh, taking the culture instead of what the Word of God says. Moses said, so that's where the law comes from, Honor your father and your mothers. Honoring your father and your mother a command of God. Yes, this passage is citing it as such. And it goes on to say, 
Anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. Somebody say amen. Well, you're supposed to say amen because this is the word of God. Now, do we stone people anymore? No. But the reason I bring this into light is from Jesus himself, this is a command of God and this is seen by the Lord as this important. You curse your mother, you curse your father. And I'm not just talking about profanity. <coughs> Although that is not supposed to be part of a Christian life. Coarse joking, dirty jokes, sexual innuendos, swearing. That is not part of the Christian life. That is not suitable for Christians. And scripture says so. I have the references in here somewhere. But if you do this, you, look at verse 13. That, that, I got to tell you, that, that's, that's a strong one for me. Thus, you nullify the word of God. You make it like it's nothing. I'm going to close with this. I don't often quote the Pope, um, but he, he tries to be Christian. Now and then he lucks out and he gets one. Um, and, 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 and in this one, he, he, he came close. Uh, in March, a couple months ago, he was talking about family. And he had heard from a girl that, uh, uh, or heard from uh, an old, old, old woman that she had children and she had not heard from them for seven to eight months. And Pope Francis says, well, actually, honoring your father and your mother, that's a mortal sin. If you don't do that one, that's a mortal sin. Now, what Catholics mean by mortal sin is, uh, you can go to hell for this one. Okay? Now, I, I don't believe that's true. But he goes on to say, you do not visit your mother for seven or eight months. That's a mortal sin. Now, I don't know how deep the rumblings in the Catholic Church went through when he said that, because I'm not Catholic and I don't believe in that system. But um, it was important enough to him to say it in that way. It is that important to God. To honor your father and honor your mother is a vital component of your Christianity. And it shows how much you love, respect, value, and are willing to obey God's word, which says it. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, first of all, we want to thank you for the mother we have and the father we have. Lord, this is by your design. You chose them for us. They are not perfect people. Forgive them for their sins. And in Jesus' name, be careful about saying amen to this one now because he's going to hold you to it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I forgive my mother and I forgive my father for their shortcomings. I ask your Holy Spirit to wipe it from my mind, take it out of my record books, expunge it, Lord, in the name of Jesus with the same effectiveness that I pray you expunge my sins from my record. I remove every past offense. I cast it in the sea of your forgetfulness and I ask you to cover it with your blood. Cause me to be more forgiving in the future towards my father and my mother. Holy Spirit, rouse my spirit that I might show my love, respect, and value and obedience to your word and your spirit by the way I love, respect, value, and obey my father and my mother, especially my mother on this day. Lord, if you need me to call or visit my father or my mother and look them in the eye and say, please, I have not been the, the son or the daughter that the Lord wants me to be. Please forgive me for that. Then stir me to do that. And let that new, renewed level of love and regard for each other cause the family to come together more powerfully. I ask you to bless our families and bless our households. And I bless you, Lord, for the mother you gave me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Everybody said amen. Thank you for coming this morning. Next week, back to Gospel Truths. Any questions? As a step-parent, I will tell you there is no substan sub substantive difference in scriptural citations between a, a, a step-parent and a, and a blood-parent. If I marry 
her. I now take on the responsibility of being a father to her kids. Now, while the real father is still alive, there's some latitude, but once he passes away, now I'm supposed to step in and, and, and be, a, be a father to them. And stepchildren, same way. You have a stepmother or a stepdaughter, you're supposed to treat them like a mother or like a father. Okay? Anything else? No? Awesome. I'm better than I thought. <laughs> Dee -dee -dee.